Professor Avi Lod. Uh, today the topic will be black holes and uh, so a closer look to black holes in particular. So I'll leave the stage to Avi. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Um, today I'll describe uh, four interesting frontiers uh, related to black hole astrophysics uh, as listed here and I'll go uh, over them in turn. So let me start with a general question that relates to the first uh, lecture that we heard last week. Uh, I discussed a model for the formation of objects, in particular spherical collapse uh, that results in the formation of galaxies and other objects in the universe, in which uh, an overdense region expands initially, then reaches maximum expansion and collapses to make an object. Now, if this uh, collapse was perfectly spherical, one would make a black hole. So why are there galaxies instead of just black holes in the universe? The answer is that there are external forks exerted on any collapsing object in the universe from neighboring objects. And as a result of that, there is a little bit of rotation, a little bit of spin given to any collapsing region in the universe. So the region does not collapse purely spherically, but has a little bit of rotation. And so as the gas cools and condenses to the center of the collapsing object, this rotation prevents the gas from reaching the center. The level of rotation is of order 5% of the velocity dispersion of the collapsing object. That's the kind of the level, the amplitude of the external effect from other neighboring objects. And that means that if the characteristic velocity dispersion of the object is roughly uh, uniform across the object, a so-called isothermal sphere, that uh, if angular momentum is conserved, as the gas collapses to the center, eventually the centrifugal support uh, will win and uh, hold the gas against farther collapse. And that would happen at roughly 5% of the virial radius of the object. So once the gas contracts to about 5% of the virial radius, the rotational speed is of order of the velocity dispersion of this object, and therefore um, the centrifugal force prevents the gas from collapsing at the center. So that is the reason we, make, we, we find in the universe these galaxies in which the gas is held against collapse by uh, rotational support. And then to make the black holes at the centers of galaxies, you need some mechanism that extracts or transports angular momentum. Now what is a black hole? Let me start from the basics. A black hole is the ultimate prison. Even light cannot escape from the gravitational pull of a black hole. So consider the Earth. We all know that uh, the escape speed from the Earth is 11 kilometers per second. So we need to exceed that speed uh, in order to launch uh, an object to an orbit far away from the Earth. Now suppose we co compress the Earth to a scale of one centimeter, this large. When we do that, the escape speed will increase to 300 kilometers per second, the speed of light. At that point, we would make a black hole. So compressing the Earth to a scale smaller than a centimeter is equivalent to making a black hole out of the Earth. According to Einstein, uh, there is no uh, distinction between space and time. And uh, Einstein realized that uh, as he developed the special theory of relativity uh, by postulating that the speed of light is uh, constant. So because the speed of light is constant, there is an equivalence between space and time because one can convert a length scale to a time scale by dividing by the speed of light. And once you start considering um, there is the equivalence principle first uh, realized by Galileo Galilei that uh, 
the response of objects to gravity does not depend on their mass or composition. And so because of that, Einstein got the insight that in fact, maybe gravity is not a force, but rather a property of space and time. And so that's how he came about uh, the general theory of relativity. And in, this, in the equations that he wrote, uh, matters, matter curves space-time, and then the curved space-time tells matter how to move. And Einstein's equations describe how matter on the left-hand side of the equation produces curvature of space-time on the right-hand side of the equation. Now, if you imagine the matter distribution having a quadrupole moment and the quadrupole being time dependent, then as a result of that, there are ripples induced in space time. For example, you can imagine two objects uh, moving around or uh, a rod moving around. Um, as a result of that, space time is perturbed in a time dependent way. So, as if you drop a stone into a pond, you generate uh, waves on the surface of the pond the same way you can produce ripples in space-time. And these are gravitational waves, a prediction of Einstein's theory of, of gravity. And uh, the realization that black holes may exist came about not by Einstein. Einstein wrote his equations and could not really figure out if there is a simple solution to these complicated equations. Uh, but uh, in the same year that Einstein published his work, 1915, Karl Schwarzschild uh, was a German astronomer. Uh, he actually went, he decided that he would like to volunteer to the German army uh, during the First World War. And uh, he went uh, to fight uh, both in the East and the West uh, fronts. And then, um, while he was uh, in the front, uh, he had some spare time and he managed to solve Einstein's equations. And he wrote a, a postcard to Einstein informing him that there is a solution that is rather simple for a point of mass uh, embedded in vacuum. And by now, this solution is called the Schwarzschild solution. Uh, during the same year, uh, Karl Schwarzschild contracted a skin disease, a, a rare skin disease, and he died the following year. He got it at the uh, uh, Russian front. And uh, there is an important lesson here that uh, being patriotic is harmful uh, for science. <laughs> Einstein, on the other hand, was a pacifist, and he uh, lived for much longer. Uh, Einstein, when he got this postcard, immediately publicized it. And this became known as the Schwarzschild uh, solution. How does a black hole uh, look like? So let me show you an image of a black hole in vacuum. That's the image. Uh, you don't see anything uh, in uh, general relativity, classical uh, physics without quantum mechanics. Uh, let me define the boundary the bo of the box in which the black hole sits here so that you will know where it is. Um, and there is a, an imaginary uh, surface, spherical uh, surface, around the black hole, which is called the event horizon. Uh, any source of light entering into that surface will not be uh, visible to us. Um, and then uh, at the center of this sphere, there is the sing so-called singularity. And of course, uh, if you were to fall towards that singularity, your, your body will be shredded by uh, ever-increasing tidal forces. And uh, for a black hole that does not have a spin, for a, a, a non-spinning black hole, there is the so-called uh, Schwarzschild radius that defines the radius of the event horizon. It's uh, twice uh, Newton's constant times the mass of the black hole divided by c squared. And one can follow photon orbits uh, around the Schwarzschild radius. Um, and you can see here trajectories of photons um, emitted in different directions from a given point above the Schwarzschild uh, horizon. And photons are able to escape if they move, for example, radially up, 
but they get very uh, significantly bent in their orbit. In fact, there is the so-called photon orbit along which uh, a photon would move in a closed circle. So there is a particular distance from the singularity in which you can see your back. Let me mention a few facts about black holes. First of all, the no hair theorem. Uh, according to classical general relativity, a black hole is characterized by three numbers. The mass of the black hole, the spin of the black hole, and its charge, electric charge. However, in astrophysics, of course, the charge is not available because it gets neutralized by opposite charges that are attracted to the black hole uh, very quickly. So in astrophysics, we are aiming to find the mass and the spin of astrophysical black holes. And then there is the cosmic censorship uh, hypo hypothesis in which, uh, which postulates that every singularity is surrounded by an event horizon. And that's very important because we can't solve uh, the equations all the way to the singularity. In fact, Einstein's equations break down very close to the singularity. We need to introduce quantum mechanics, and we don't have uh, a verified uh, quantum extension of general relativity. There are suggestions, but we don't know if they're right. And so we cannot really make predictions as to how singularities behave. Uh, and the fact that there is an event horizon protects us from this uncertainty. And so uh, the existence of event horizons uh, allow us to uh, evolve, for example, the universe around a singularity because there is no causal connection between what is going on close to the singularity and the rest of the universe. No signal can propagate from that region outside the horizon. In general, quantum mechanics uh, starts to play an important role not only in the singularity, but also for wavelengths that are comparable to the horizon size. And there is the important phenomenon of Hawking radiation, which is academically interesting, but it's not uh, relevant to astrophysical black holes because the characteristic Schwarzschild radius of astrophysical black holes is uh, often larger than a kilometer, and therefore quantum mechanical effects are, are quite small. Um, and the first uh, aspect of astrophysical black holes that I would like to address is whether we can get an image of a black hole. And this is a picture from uh, a Scientific American article that we wrote with Avery Broderick uh, on this subject. So there are two reasons to uh, uh, attempt to take a photo, a photograph of a black hole. One is that it would allow us to test the behavior of the gas near the black hole. Uh, we have uh, developed models for how gas accretes onto black holes, uh, how accretion disks look like, uh, and how jets might be produced uh, in these environments. But we would like to test these uh, models. And one way to do that is to take an image of the vicinity of the black hole. And then the second aspect, which is perhaps more fundamental, is uh, testing general relativity in the strong field limit. We have tested general relativity mostly in the weak field limit, but close to a black hole, there is an environment where gravity is extremely strong, and we would like to see if general relativity describes adequately uh, the behavior of material objects there. The nearest black hole we have is the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, Sagittarius A star. And we know that there is a black hole there from monitoring the orbits of stars in the vicinity of the galactic center. Uh, just like uh, the orbits of planets, it, they allow us to infer the mass uh, using Newton's laws of uh, motion. The mass of the black hole is 4.5 million solar masses at a distance of uh, 8.4 kiloparsecs, or around 25,000 light years. Now, the interesting aspect of Sagittarius A star is that it's the largest black hole on the sky. And if we were to uh, attempt to image a black hole, uh, this particular one would be the best target to go after, because it occupies the largest angle on the sky among all the black holes that we suspect exist. There are stellar mass black holes that are closer to us, but they have a much smaller mass. 
Now, uh, in the United States, there is a commercial uh, of uh, that uh, tests uh, a cell phone. Uh, belongs to a company called Verizon. And that person moves around from place to place and asks, can you hear me now? So I, we just imagine this person getting close to Sagittarius A star and asking, can you hear me now? <laughs> and uh, we put this uh, illustration uh, as part of the Scientific American article that I mentioned before. Turns out that uh, a relative of this particular person is on the editorial board of Scientific American. She was very pleased <laughs> to see her uh, relative there, but until she realized that uh, his fate will not be very uh, promising as he gets closer to the horizon. Um, and what would happen is, in fact, um, nothing will happen to, to his body, uh, even though the gravitational acceleration uh, reaches a value close to a million times that on the surface of the Earth. Uh, the uh, acceleration difference across the body that has only a size of a couple of meters is really small because the size of the horizon is 10 million kilometers. So the tidal force is small. The, this person will uh, still be healthy as it, he passes the horizon. And then at some point, uh, we will not be able to hear him anymore. We will get a frozen image of him as he uh, crosses the horizon. And uh, it will take another 10 minutes or so. We, we could still tell him what to do because he will get our signals. And uh, we will tell him that we, do, we cannot hear him, but he has about 10 minutes until he will reach the singularity. And at that point, of course, he will not survive. So anyone that has a terminal disease might prefer to try this uh, particular journey. It should be quite exciting. Um, and the interesting question is whether general relativity is a valid description of strong gravity, as I mentioned before. And one way to test that is to monitor the image of Sagittarius A star. We know that there is variability of the flux that comes from Sag A star, and that could be associated with hot spots in the gas that is accreting onto it. Uh, the innermost stable circular orbit around Sagittarius A star has a radius of uh, 30 micro arc seconds. And arc second is the scale that can be resolved by, by an amateur astronomer. Here we're talking about a million times smaller scale on the sky. Obviously, no telescope can resolve right now the scale of a micro arc second. But as I'll describe in a few minutes, we are able right now to reach this level of 30 micro arc second resolution. And that's for a, a non-spinning black hole. The orbital time at this innermost stable circular orbit, also called the ISCO, uh, is uh, 30 minutes. So that's quite convenient. We can monitor the, the hotspot as it moves around. And in fact, there is uh, an instrument aimed to see variability in the centroid of such a star as hotspots move around. So there would be some flickering, some motion of the center of light of the black hole due to the fact that hotspots move around it. And in principle, one can infer the orbital period from that. And this instrument is called gravity. It will be uh, eventually used on the VLT, the Very Large Telescope. But as I'll describe in a few minutes, uh, there is an even better uh, telescope that is able to uh, resolve the image of Sagittarius A star. And not only that, but also of M87. So here is a, an illustration from a simple calculation. Suppose you have a flashlight moving around. Uh, of course, the observer doesn't see one spot. It sees two of them because of gravitational lensing. And as we change the inclination of the orbit of this uh, flashlight, uh, the image changes. And uh, Basically, what you see is the effect of gravitational lensing producing multiple images, one of which is brighter because of the relatively high velocity of the orb orbital uh, orbiting uh, source. And there are the images that one sees uh, are mainly three. Uh, first, there is the primary image coming directly from the flashlight that we are looking at. Then there is the secondary image that uh, 
is a result of gravitational lensing where there is a detour of uh, some photons emitted in some direction which uh, go around the black hole and appear uh, in a different spot. So the primary image is this uh, blue image here. And then there is the secondary image, which is the green one here. And then there is a third image, the tertiary image, which makes a full orb, uh, the photons of which make a full orbit around the black hole and come back to be observed as a relatively uh, thin sliver uh, appearing here. And altogether, it looks more or less like a ring, uh, one side of which is brighter than the other side due to the Doppler effect. So uh, the final image that one gets, of course, has a silhouette in the middle, a shadow, due to the fact that photons that uh, fall towards the black hole um, get absorbed by the black hole. So there is this dark region in the middle. That's the shadow of the black hole. And then uh, on one side, uh, uh, the, the emitting uh, material is orbiting towards the observer, and therefore the emission appears brighter. But uh, the image, the shape of the image and its characteristics will depend on the inclination angle of the orbital plane relative to the line of sight. It would depend also on the spin of the black hole because the innermost stable circular orbit radius depends on the spin. And so in principle, by uh, having a very high quality image, one can infer the spin of the black hole and the inclination. And there is a third angle, the position angle as well. Now, the spin obviously matters because, for example, the binding energy of gas at the innermost stable circular orbit is a function of the spin parameter. And, and A is usually used to define the spin parameter in units of the maximum value, which is related to the black hole spinning at the speed of light. So uh, the black hole can either rotate in the same direction as the orbiting material or in the opposite direction where the spin parameter is minus one and the fraction of the binding energy relative to the rest mass of the material at the ISCO depends of course on the ISCO radius which in turn depends on the spin parameter. So it turns out that this uh, so-called radiative efficiency. This is the amount of energy that, in principle, can be radiated away from the orbiting gas. It reaches 42% uh, for a maximally spinning black hole, uh, only 5.7% for a zero-spin black hole, and then an even lower value for an, an anti-spinning uh, black hole. Now, uh, this is a result of the fact that the ISCO radius itself is a function of the spin parameter. Um, and you can see it um, in this plot. For a zero uh, spin black hole, the ISCO is at uh, 6 GM over C squared, or three times the Schwarzschild radius. Uh, and the horizon radius also depends on the spin. It's at 2 GM over C squared, as I already mentioned, for a zero spin Schwarzschild black hole. And then it uh, falls to 1 times GM over C squared for uh, a maximally spinning black hole. So the spin definitely uh, matters. And if you're interested in more details on how these parameters relate to observations, I highly recommend Mario's uh, book. Uh, foundations on high energy astrophysics. Uh, the special feature of this book is that it derives everything from basic principles. So I highly recommend it for people interested in the details. Now, with respect to uh, Sagittarius A star, there are three fortunate coincidences. And nature was very kind in this case. Uh, the first coincidence is that the accretion flow of the gas onto uh, Sagittarius A star becomes transparent to synchrotron self-absorption uh, at photon wavelengths that are shorter than one millimeter. This is uh, just a reflection of the gas density that is accreting right now onto Sagittarius A star. Perhaps in the past, the accretion rate was higher, the density of the gas was higher, and the opacity of the gas was higher. But right now, the gas becomes transparent at a wavelength shorter than one millimeter. So one millimeter is the threshold. Turns out that uh, the interstellar medium 
along the line of sight to the source scatters uh, the radio waves and uh, blurs the image of this radio source. And the wavelength at which the blurring is insignificant relative to the scale of interest, the size of the ISCO, for example, the angular size of the ISCO, uh, it so happens that the blurring becomes insignificant at wavelengths less than one millimeter. And this is a pure coincidence that the, at the same wavelength you get the uh, lack of blurring due to the interstellar medium and the lack of absorption due to the accreting gas. And then there is the third coincidence. You can ask yourself, given the distance to Sagittarius A star, we know the angular size that it occupies, the black hole there, given the mass of the black hole. And as I mentioned, it's of order 30 micro arc seconds. Then if you want to build a telescope on Earth that has that resolution, the resolution of a telescope is given by the wavelength divided by the size of the aperture. The biggest aperture we can build on Earth would be as big as the Earth. So you can ask, suppose we, big a telescope as, we build a telescope as big as the Earth, what would be the wavelength for which we will get the necessary resolution? And the answer is one millimeter. One millimeter over the diameter of the Earth gives you just the right resolution to be able to image Sagittarius A star. And it's a pure coincidence that all three considerations lead to the same wavelength. And we are lucky to live at a time when the accretion rate onto such a star just gives us transparency at wavelengths shorter than one millimeter. And so the only thing that remains is to, be the, to build a telescope as big as the Earth. And in fact, uh, John Wheeler had uh, a student back in the 60s that was thinking about uh, whether one can obtain an image of a black hole, but that student did it for his uh, senior thesis and realized that it's not practical to do that. So he decided to move out of astrophysics. And uh, he actually moved into a subject that I worked on for my master thesis, which is clearly not practical. It turns out that it's not practical, but he's working on it. And I actually uh, wrote an email to him uh, once I realized that he did his senior thesis on this topic to tell him that he made the wrong move, that he should have stayed in this, uh, because by now we have the technology to do the experiment. Yes. Um, so here are examples of theoretically calculated images of Sagittarius A star at different frequencies. Um, 300 gigahertz corresponds roughly to a millimeter wavelength. So at low frequencies, the, um, what, you see, what you're looking at is uh, uh, snapshots at different phases of the hotspot around Sagittarius A star. As it moves around, uh, the image changes. When you include interstellar blurring, then the image gets more fuzzy. But as you uh, use a higher frequency, the image is sharper, both because um, the blurring is less important, but also because for a given aperture size, uh, your resolution gets better as you go to higher frequency. And so the idea of how to build a telescope as big as the Earth is to do it uh, with radio uh, interferometry, where you have uh, several observatories around the globe, and you correlate the signal that you receive from them and use the Earth as a giant interferometer. And we're talking here about interferometry at sub-millimeter wavelengths. And so there are such observatories. Uh, there is one in Hawaii. There is another one in uh, California, uh, KARMA. There is another one in Arizona, SMTO. There is uh, the LMT uh, in New Mexico. And uh, of course, uh, ALMA is uh, starting to operate uh, in Chile. And also, there, are, uh, there is one at Plateau de Boer and uh, Pico Veleta. And so uh, one can imagine connecting these different uh, observatories and correlating the signal that one gets, the electromagnetic wave, including uh, the phase as well as the amplitude, uh, at these different locations such that one uses them as an interferometer 
And that was not attempted in the distant past at, at such short wavelengths. Um, there, there is the very large baseline interferometer that uses radio observatories at longer wavelengths, centimeters to, to meter wavelengths. But at millimeter wavelength, wavelengths, uh, it was only attempted recently. And these observatories in green are already operational. Uh, ALMA is about to get online. And there is the South Pole Telescope uh, that can also be connected. And it will be very important because it gives us uh, a large liver arm that gives the highest resolution uh, of this array. So by now, only three of these uh, stations were used, correlated. Uh, the, uh, the one in uh, Hawaii, uh, California, and Arizona, and they form a triangle. And using the data that was obtained in two observing seasons, we uh, tried to constrain uh, the spin and uh, the, the inclination angle for Sagittarius A star. And usually when uh, you process the data that comes into an inter interferometer, the inter interferometer takes a Fourier transform of the sky. And uh, the Fourier transform is uh, in the UV um, plane. These are the Fourier components of the sky. And you can see here in white dots uh, the points in the Fourier space where uh, data was taken. And based on that, this is our best fit image uh, for Sagittarius A star. Uh, and we also, of course, try to fit the spectrum of Sagittarius A star at the same time with a simple model for the accretion flow. And using all the data available, we constructed, and this is work uh, led by Avery Broderick uh, in collaboration with Shep Dolman that uh, took the data, and uh, Vincent Fish, uh, we were able to construct probability distributions for the spin, and the probability distribution for the spin, if you marginalize over the other parameter, parameters, uh, peaks uh, at around the spin of zero. So this is the two-dimensional uh, map uh, of constraints uh, for the spin and the inclination angle. And low spin values appear to be favored. Um, so based on the existing data, we would say that probably the black hole has a relatively low spin. And the inclination angle is somewhere between 60 and uh, 85 degrees uh, based on the existing data. Now, the same can be done in principle for M87. M87 is an elliptical galaxy, a giant elliptical galaxy that has a much bigger black hole at its center. So even though it's very far away, uh, the apparent size of the black hole is not much smaller than Sagittarius A star. The traditional value for the black hole mass is 3 billion solar masses, uh, which is 700 times the mass of Sagittarius A star. The distance of M87 is 16 megaparsecs, which is 2,000 miles farther than Sag A star. So naively, one would say uh, the image should be roughly half the angular size of Sagittarius A star. But uh, more recently, a few years ago, Gebhardt and Thomas uh, argued that the mass uh, in the past, the mass estimate was too low, that in fact, uh, if you include the dark matter in the modeling of M87, uh, the mass is twice as large, 6.4, 10 to the 9 solar masses. And if that is true, then the apparent size of M87's uh, black hole could be as large as Sagittarius A star. So it's definitely a very good target to look at. And in the past, people looked at it only at uh, using interferometry only at a relatively long wavelengths, seven millimeters or longer, that give limited resolution. They could not reach very close to the black hole. But uh, one can, in principle, use shorter uh, wavelength, millimeter wavelength. And we try to predict with Avery Broderick, uh, once again, uh, the kind of images you would get. And here, the situation is more complicated in terms of predictions because there is the jet. And we considered, in particular, uh, six models for the jet, six possible uh, uh, parameter choices. And in all of them, even though the bright regions look quite different, 
uh, you can see evidence for a silhouette, a shadow of the black hole. And these images were calculated for the conservative estimate of the mass. Uh, of course, if you double the mass, then the size of the image would increase by a factor of two. And so it would be relatively straightforward to resolve it with uh, upcoming data. And data was already uh, taken uh, for uh, M87. I just don't have uh, right now uh, the ability to show you the, the results. And so uh, in principle, one can go after the size of the shadow in M87, and one can also explore how the jet is being launched close to the black hole, which is a very interesting question in the context of theoretical astrophysics. Uh, by now, people have done numerical simulations, including uh, magnetohydrodynamic uh, flows uh, in the vicinity of a black hole, including generativity. Uh, and you can see the kind of image that one gets uh, from the GR MHD simulations. Uh, this uh, region here is the silhouette, the shadow of the black hole. And of course, the accretion flow of the gas has fluctuations in it. And so the image does not appear as smooth as in the simplest uh, models that I showed before. Uh, the setup in uh, sort of real space, not in the observer view, was a torus here. And uh, uh, let me show you how the gas uh, accreted from that torus. Oops. So you can see, uh, starting from a torus, an initial torus, the gas falls towards the black hole, and there is a lot of turbulence generated, which transports angular momentum outwards and allows the, the gas to accrete. And the image that one sees is the one that I showed before. Now, how do black holes accrete gas? As I mentioned briefly, you need to transport angular momentum outwards in order to allow the gas to migrate towards the black hole. And here again uh, is a simulation using uh, magnetic turbulence uh, in an initial uh, configuration that is a torus around the black hole. So the black hole is situated here. And the system is axially uh, symmetric. So imagine uh, symmetry around the axis defined by the left uh, and border of this simulation box. And so eventually, starting from a torus, the gas eventually migrates inwards and accretes onto ISCO. And the transport of angular momentum is mediated by magnetic, uh, magnetohydrodynamic turbulence, the magnetorotational instability. And eventually, one gets a quasi steady state of uh, accretion. Of course, black holes are not uh, being made only at the centers of galaxies. We also see evidence for black holes uh, when stars consume their nuclear fuel. A massive star uh, would eventually uh, collapse, and the core of the star would make a black hole. And, and as matter falls onto that black hole, in principle, uh, the black hole may produce jets and these would appear, uh, after they penetrate through the envelope of the star, they would appear as gamma ray bursts, flashes of gamma rays that we can see all the way out to the edge of the universe. There uh, are other systems where we see potential evidence for the birth of a black hole. For example, there was a supernova that took off in 1979. So that's more than 30 uh, years ago. Uh, 33 years ago, um, and the X-ray emission from that particular supernova in 1979C, which was a very powerful supernova, uh, the X-ray luminosity appears to be constant uh, over at least the past uh, 15 years or so. And that constant X-ray luminosity appears to be uh, very close to the limiting luminosity you would expect for a black hole of five solar masses that might have been born at the center of that remnant. But of course, as I mentioned, bigger black holes form at the centers of galaxies. 
And we see evidence that such uh, events uh, occur very early in the universe. So there is a luminous quasar that was discovered uh, a year ago at a redshift of 7.1. Uh, the black hole mass is estimated to be 2 billion solar masses. Only uh, 0.8 billion years after the Big Bang. How can one make a black hole so massive so early in the evolution of the universe? Before I get to that question, let me explain what a quasar is. A quasar is a supermassive black hole, gas, and shines brightly, and is typically found at the central region of a galaxy. And in the context of a black hole, um, there is a limiting luminosity, as I mentioned, that is related to the fact that when radiation is produced close to the black hole, there is a force pushing the gas out. And this force is given by the luminosity. Uh, if one divides the luminosity by the speed of light, one gets the rate of uh, momentum flowing out, momentum per unit time. Since the photons are moving at the speed of light, the momentum per unit time emitted from the vicinity of the black hole is the luminosity divided by the speed of light. And then if we spread that momentum deposition over uh, the surface area of a sphere of radius r, uh, that surface area would be 4 pi r squared, then we get the rate of momentum deposited per unit area uh, on that sphere. Uh, and then this momentum flux uh, is being intercepted by an electron. And so the electron has a cross-section given by the Thomson uh, value, the Thomson cross-section. Uh, and this gives the total force, the momentum per unit time, acting on the uh, electron. So that's the force outwards pushing an electron out due to the momentum flux uh, associated with the radiation em emanating from the vicinity of the black hole. And of course, for every electron, there is a proton uh, for which there is um, an inward force pulling it towards the black hole. It's given by the gravitational acceleration, gm over r squared, times the mass of the proton. So for every electron-proton pair, uh, the outward force needs to be uh, smaller than the inward force in order to allow accretion. And so that gives the sense of a limiting luminosity when the two forces are equal, which is called the Eddington luminosity. It's given by equating these two uh, forces and noticing that the distance dependence cancels out. So this luminosity applies, at least in the Newtonian regime, it applies at all distances. And the value of this luminosity is close to 10 to the 38 ergs per second for a black hole of one solar mass. But for a black hole of a billion solar masses, it's uh, close to 10 to the 47 ergs per second, roughly the luminosity of quasars that we find at, at high redshifts. And now one can write very simple equations that describe the growth of the black hole. Uh, if one associates the luminosity coming from the vicinity of the black hole with the mass accretion rate, so that's the rate by which mass falls into the ISCO per unit time, m dot times c squared, uh, with an, a radiative efficiency of epsilon, that gives us the luminosity emitted by the accreting gas. And if that's some fraction of the Eddington luminosity, then one can solve for the growth of the black hole mass as a function of time, because the Eddington luminosity is proportional to the mass, and we end up with an equation that says m dot is proportional to m. So that leads to an exponential growth of the mass of the black hole. And the growth is on a characteristic time scale, the Eddington time, which is given by, uh, it depends, of course, on fundamental constants, and also on the radiative efficiency epsilon and the Eddington fraction, eta. And the value is 40 million years. That's the exponential e-folding time of a black hole mass. It's 40 million years for epsilon over eta of 10%. And as I mentioned, a radiative efficiency of order 10% is what you get for uh, a mildly spinning black hole. 
uh, eta close to unity is what we infer from many, many quasars. Now, even if you adapt this if folding time, you find that when you start with a stellar mass seed, suppose we start to grow a black hole from solar masses, the seed mass that you get from a star, uh, there is barely enough time to grow the observed quasar black hole at a redshift of 7.1 if we take eta, e, e, epsilon over eta of 10%. Uh, you basically need to feed that seed black hole steadily with no interruption over the entire Hubble time. And that seems unlikely. There must be interruptions in the process. And so one way out to resolve this uh, constraint would be to say that there must be a phase in the growth of the black hole when the radiative efficiency is very small. And one possibility to get that is if a lot of gas falls onto the black hole such that the diffusion time of photons outwards through that gas is actually uh, very long. The diffusion velocity is given by the speed of light divided by the optical depth of the gas. And if that diffusion velocity outwards for the photons is much smaller than the infall velocity of the gas inwards towards the black hole, then the photons will be carried with the gas. They will not be able to escape. They will be trapped with the gas. And the radiative efficiency could be practically zero. So if there is a phase by which the blanket of gas that falls into the black hole traps the radiation, then, in principle, you can grow the black hole very fast because the e-folding time can be very short. And this is actually what happens when a star collapses. When a star collapses, all the photons are being trapped with the gas that falls to make the black hole. And, of course, the e-folding time is much shorter. Now, what we see is that uh, the black hole masses of galaxies are not... Uh, arbitrary, they seem to be correlated with the depth of the gravitational potential well of those galaxies, often characterized by the velocity dispersion of the stars. Uh, more massive galaxies with higher velocity dispersion appear to have more massive black holes. And moreover, the galaxies that show quasar activity are a small minority. They're, they represent the brightest quasars, represent about 1% of uh, the galaxies at any given cosmic epoch uh, at high redshifts. And the mass of the black hole is smaller, of course, than the ma mass of the galaxy as a whole. So an interesting question is, why are quasars short-lived? Why do they represent a short phase in the evolution of galaxies? even though almost all galaxies have black holes at their center? And the answer is because they're suicidal. Uh, when black holes accrete gas, they produce a lot of energy and momentum. And uh, the energy momentum released is sufficient to unbind the gas that feeds the black hole. And once you unbind the gas from the host galaxy, there is the, the accretion stops. The situation is similar to uh, a small baby that uh, eats too much and then pushes away the food from the table. That's what uh, supermassive black holes do. And of course, that leads naturally to a correlation between the mass of the black hole and the depth of the gravitational potential well of the galaxy. The deeper the potential well is, the easier it is for the galaxy to retain the gas despite uh, the uh, in increased uh, energy deposition or momentum deposition into the gas. So big galaxies are able to retain the gas until the black hole grows to a higher value of its mass. Uh, but small black holes are able to remove the gas from uh, dwarf galaxies and therefore they stop growing at an early stage. Now we can easily estimate what should be the black hole mass if a fraction epsilon gal from that ma uh, rest mass energy is deposited into the galaxy. So let's assume that a small fraction, 1% or so, of the black hole mass times c squared is being deposited in the gas of the galaxy. The binding energy of that gas is the mass of the gas times the dispersion squared of the galaxy. And the typical value of the velocity dispersion 
uh, for dwarf galaxies, it's 10 to the minus 4 of the speed of light, while for uh, large galaxies, elliptical galaxies, it's of order 10 to the minus 3 of the speed of light. So uh, the mass that the black hole will grow up to before it releases enough energy to unbind the gas turns out for uh, a coupling efficiency of 1% turns out to be of the order of 10 to the minus 5 of uh, the mass of the gas. So black holes do not need to grow to a significant fraction of the galaxy mass before they produce a huge amount of energy that can unbind uh, the gas in that galaxy. And by now, there are numerical simulations that employ a very simplified prescription for the energy deposition uh, uh, of uh, growing black holes at the centers of galaxies due to, for example, a merger of two galaxies. And here is a simulation done by uh, Springer et al. Uh, seven years ago, uh, where two galaxies uh, of the same mass are merging, and there is a black hole at the center of each of them. And the black hole is being fed by gas accretion, and then uh, it releases energy and dissipates that energy in the gas which gets heated, and eventually the gas gets uh, heated to the point where it's removed from the galaxy, and you end up with a merger product that is devoid of cold gas. Even though the two galaxies that merged had a lot of cold gas, they, they were disk galaxies to start with, you end up with an elliptical galaxy that has only hot gas uh, and uh, not much uh, cold gas in it. And of course, the quasar shuts off at that point. And we see evidence, of course, for galaxy mergers. And galaxy mergers would lead to binary black hole systems before uh, the final merger makes a single black hole. And there are many examples of binary uh, active galactic nuclei. By now, for example, uh, this is a, uh, a collection of images from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey of many binary black hole systems, starting from a separation of 9.1 kiloparsecs and going down to a separation of 1.7 kiloparsec here. Of course, there must be many more that have even smaller separations, but uh, it's difficult to resolve those. And with X-rays, we see evidence that even in uh, galaxies that are enshrouded in dust, uh, there are sometimes uh, you find uh, double X-ray sources that may represent two black holes, supermassive black holes formed or accreting during the merger process. And here is another example. Uh, this image was taken uh, in X-rays uh, between 6 and 7 kV. And it clearly shows evidence for two centers of X-ray emission. And we can see uh, binary black hole systems also in, red, in the radio. Here is an example where there are radio jets, and there are two possible centers for the radio emission and the origin of these jets. And this is the tightest uh, binary black hole system that has a projected separation of only seven parsecs, an estimated total mass of a billion solar masses observed in the radio uh, at 1.35 gigahertz with a very large baseline interferometry. Now, uh, typically a quasar is producing UV radiation that gets reprocessed by uh, so-called uh, broad line clouds. These are clouds orbiting very close, less than a tenth of a parsec from the uh, black hole uh, that apparently absorb the UV radiation and re-emit it uh, in emission lines because these clouds are very dense. It's either clouds or perhaps an outflow of gas. But the bottom line is that it produces uh, an emission line which has uh, a large width, uh, it's broad, of, uh, it has a width of 5,000 kilometers per second, typically. Then there is an emission region which is much larger, roughly the size of the core of the galaxy, which emits uh, the narrow line component. And that has a characteristic width comparable to the velocity dispersion of the galaxy. 
So you can imagine each quasar is having a broad line region and a narrow line region much farther out where the velocity dispersion is only hundreds of kilometers per second. Now when two such quasars merge, uh, what would happen at large separations, they will have their own narrow line region and broad line region, but as they come close, they may share the same narrow line region, but will still have two separate broad line regions. And eventually, they will share the same broad line region as well. And we have evidence for systems that have double narrow line regions, and these may be good candidates for binary black hole systems. The problem is that there is contamination in this sample also of systems that have a gaseous disk where you get a double picked profile just from the geometry of a disk where you have orbiting gas and you get Doppler effect from the two sides of the disk. But some of these systems are definitely due to um, dual black hole systems. And in a paper that uh, we posted with my student uh, Laura Blecka and Ramesh Narayan, we showed through numerical simulations how one gets double narrow line features in uh, dual black hole systems, in galaxy merger simulations. One can also get double broad, line, uh, broad lines when the black holes get very close to each other, but that actually turns out to be difficult to identify. And one simple way to tell is using a reverberation mapping if one does uh, if one monitors the flux as a function of time, then one can see an echo of the variability of one of the uh, sources represented in uh, the shape of the, of the broad lines. Uh, another interesting uh, type of system that one gets when one has a merger, once the merger progresses so that the secondary black hole gets inside the accretion disk, of the primary black hole, then the situation resembles, in principle, a planet, a massive planet orbiting a star uh, in a protoplanetary disk. And we're all familiar with the possibility that a gap may form in the disk because the secondary may clean up. If it's uh, massive enough, it may clean up a gap uh, in the disk. And in fact, in a recent paper that uh, we just posted with Ben Sekosis and Zoltan Hyman, we demonstrated that in the case of a secondary black hole system, the gap may not be completely empty. In fact, some of the gas may be able, what, what happens is the secondary builds up uh, a dam, a gas piles up in this boundary, and eventually there is an overflow uh, of gas across the dam. And it turns out that disks that have partial gap like that have uh, a very distinct spectral features. So if the disk without uh, partial gap would have this uh, spectrum, this is the uh, uh, new L nu, the, the luminosity per logarithmic frequency interval as a function of frequency, then once you have this partial gap, you get a very different spectrum. And perhaps searching for uh, uh, active galactic nuclei that show evidence for uh, a gap in, in their spectrum would be a, a very interesting uh, way of finding uh, binary systems. And it turns out that there is, just like in planetary uh, systems, there is type 1 migration, type 2 migration. And in the case of black holes, uh, we identified another set of solution between type 1 and type 2, where the, gas is, uh, the gap is not completely empty, and gas is able to flow through the gap, and we called it type 1.5. Turns out that systems with this type of migration have uh, actually a much longer lifetime. And the lifetime could be as long as uh, 10 to the 7 years uh, for a mass ratio of 10 to the minus 3, for example. And these are systems that, in principle, produce gravitational waves that are uh, detectable. One can get not just binary black hole system, but in fact, if the two black holes do not merge by the time a third galaxy joins, uh, then you might get three black hole systems or more. And we actually examined the possibility of that uh, in a paper with a student last year, Jiris um, Kulkarni, and we find that, found that uh, in, in some cases you can get three or four black hole systems. And when you have three black hole systems, 
you can get a, a slingshot effect that ejects a black hole with a very high speed of, order of several thousands of kilometers per second away from the merger product. Another type of binaries you can get is a small black hole, either produced in the accretion disk due to the formation of a massive star that makes a black hole, or uh, a stellar mass black hole that was captured by the disk. And these systems are called extreme mass ratio in spirals, uh, EMRIs, and they could be interesting uh, sources of gravitational waves. So gravitational waves are produced when a binary black hole system orbits. And uh, by now, of course, there are uh, some detectors that uh, are being constructed. For example, advanced LIGO that will become operational within a couple of years will have the sensitivity to detect black hole or neutron star binaries uh, at distances of several hundred megaparsecs. And it's quite remarkable the sensitivity that one reaches in these uh, observatories is uh, thousands of the diameter of a proton. And there is a plan to build a space interferometer that will be able to detect uh, the, the gravitational waves from uh, supermassive black hole binaries. Uh, altogether, this is a new frontier for the future, gravitational wave astrophysics. And I'm personally very excited about it. I think it will open a new window into the universe and will allow us to test the Einstein's theory of general relativity. And by now, uh, there are numerical simulations that are able to calculate what happens to the space-time when two black holes uh, come and merge to make a single black hole. And these simulations uh, were successful at producing uh, converging, result, converging to results uh, about five years ago. And by now we have templates of the gravitational wave signal that one would get. But what they show is also that when two galaxies come together, and here you see the gas and the stars, and this is a, a view from above of the two galaxies and a view from the side uh, on the left and right panels. Uh, you see when two galaxies come together, if gravitational waves give a kick to the black hole, then it would affect uh, the appearance of the merger product, because the black hole will get kicked out of the center of the merger product. And gravitational wave recoil uh, operates on a very simple physical basis. When you have, for example, a massive black hole that is merging with a smaller mass black hole, as the smaller mass black hole falls uh, to the ISCO, event and, and eventually, once it reaches the ISCO, it plunges onto the supermassive black hole it will emit gravitational waves in a preferred direction. And because of momentum conservation, uh, the system, the, the remnant black hole, will get kicked in the opposite direction. So the gravitational waves carry some momentum out of the system in a preferred direction, and then the remnant black hole will get kicked in the opposite direction. Have we observed an example of a kicked black hole? Well, this is one candidate, the leading candidate, CID uh, 42 that uh, was observed most recently by Francesca Civano and uh, collaborators. Uh, in this system, we see two sources of X-rays and uh, optical UV emission, and they are uh, offset by 2.5 kiloparsecs. Uh, and there is a velocity offset uh, between uh, the two centers that is uh, of the order of a thousand kilometers per second. So it's potentially a kicked black hole. So one of these uh, is the kicked black hole, and the, cent the second center is just the, the galaxy that is left behind. And of course, if there is a recoil, then that would affect the growth of the black hole. And the, uh, we, we've done, uh, in collaboration uh, with Laura Blecker, my student, Many simulations in which you see the orbits of kicked black holes in a merger simulation. And one finds that uh, the effect of the kick uh, depends a lot on when it happens, because the escape speed from the galaxy is increasing dramatically as the merger proceeds, because a lot of gas is falling towards the center. And so if the black hole is kicked early in the process, it will reach a large distance and can even leave the galaxy. 
But if it's kicked late in the process, it will stay bound to the center. Another interesting uh, implication of these kicks is that as we assemble, for example, the Milky Way galaxy out of small building blocks, you can imagine that every merger of the small building blocks may have produced a binary black hole system that resulted in a kick. And these building blocks had shallow potential wells. These were the dwarf galaxies that made the Milky Way galaxy. And so a kicked black hole with a few hundred kilometers per second could easily escape the shallow potential well of a dwarf galaxy, which uh, has an escape speed of 10 kilometers per second or so. And so all these black holes that were, uh, re that were kicked when the dwarf galaxies merged to make the Milky Way galaxy, they will now be in the halo of the Milky Way galaxy. And they will not be on their own. They will be surrounded by star clusters that were carried with the black holes as they were ejected. So the prediction from the hierarchical uh, formation of the Milky Way is that there should be 100 black holes or so that were ejected during the assembly of the Milky Way galaxy out of small dwarf galaxies. And they should carry star clusters from uh, the, their host uh, dwarf galaxy. And these star clusters are quite different than globular clusters. They are dominated by the gravity of the black hole at the center. Uh, they are very compact, uh, less than a parsec, and they have a high velocity dispersion because of the black hole at their center, 10 to 100 kilometers per second. And we actually searched the Sloan Digital Sky Survey for these black holes, and we found some candidates photometrically but a spectroscopic follow-up is really needed in order to see if any of them is related to a recoiled black hole. So star clusters in the Milky Way could represent recoiled black holes. The final topic I wanted to cover has to do with tidal disruption of stars near a supermassive black hole. When a star comes close enough to a black hole, uh, the tidal force is strong, is sufficiently strong to tear it into a stream of gas. It makes a spaghetti out of the, out of the star. And uh, the disruption of a black hole, uh, the disruption of a star by a black hole has a rate of uh, once per 100,000 years for a galaxy like the Milky Way. And the reason the rate is so low is because all the stars that could have been disrupted were disrupted very quickly, and then one is left with the so-called lost cone, where there are no stars that have orbits that pass close enough to the black hole to be disrupted. And stars get uh, scattered into the lost cone, into this dangerous zone where they get disrupted uh, at a slow rate. Uh, due to star star scattering, the rate is only once per 100,000 years. And actually, black holes with a mass bigger than 10 to the 8 solar masses do not produce tidal disruption. They simply sw they have such a large mouth that they swallow the star before it gets disrupted. And when a star gets disrupted by a black hole of less than 10 to the 8 solar masses, the, the feeding rate of the black hole is extremely large. You get roughly 30% of the mass of the star over the pericenter time feeding the black hole. And that usually is several orders of magnitude more than the Huntington feeding rate. And interestingly enough, this could be uh, a way of uh, testing whether there is a black hole uh, recoil, because when a black hole gets a recoil, uh, it will start to run in some direction where there are fresh um, uh, targets for it uh, fresh stars for it to, to eat, to, to disrupt. Uh, so uh, a recoil black hole might see many more stars that it can disrupt than a, a stationary black hole. And when you calculate the rate that you would get from a kicked black hole, you find that it could be once per 10 years, once per 100 years, uh, under reasonable conditions. So you might even see a repeating uh, tidal disruption event from a system in which the black hole had a recoil. And that is simply because uh, as the black hole moves, it moves stars that it could disrupt. Uh, the lost cone is becoming full again. 
There was one exciting event that took place last year and was observed, which represents a jet, a collimated outflow, resulting from the disruption of a star near black hole. And the interesting point about this event is that you can put a, that you can treat it as an experiment. Uh, the star that got disrupted moved in an orbit that had no particular relation to the spin of the black hole. So imagine the spin of the black hole uh, being in some direction, let's say in this direction, and the star, the orbital plane of the star had an angular momentum that was oriented at some angle beta relative to the spin of the black hole. And now the interesting question is if the accreting material onto the black hole is misoriented at the spin of the black hole, in which direction will the jet point? If the jet was pointing along uh, perpendicular to the disk or the uh, orbital angular momentum of the star, then it would precess. Turns out that when you have a, a misalignment of the disk angular momentum relative to the black hole spin, uh, angular momentum, you, uh, there is a, a generativistic precession that takes place. And if there would have been a precession, then the jet would point at the observer only for a limited amount of time. So by observing this event for a long time, in fact, more than two weeks in the X-rays, one can constrain uh, the level of precession of the jet. And so when we did that with my student Nick Stone, we published it in Physical Review Letters, we concluded that there are two possibilities. Either, since we observed this uh, event for more than two weeks, either the this uh, angle between the disk angular momentum and the black hole spin was less than a degree, which is very unlikely, or the jet was oriented actually with the black hole spin rather than with the jet, uh, rather than with the disk angular momentum. And theoretically speaking, this problem was not solved uh, theoretically speaking, it's not known whether in a misaligned uh, configuration uh, one would expect, using a, a GRMHD simulation, one would expect the jet to, to be aligned either with the disk or the black hole spin. What we concluded from this event is that it was probably aligned with the black hole spin. So that's an interesting laboratory of generativistic uh, effects. And finally, there is, speaking about tidal disruption, there is evidence that uh, a gas cloud is approaching the black hole at the galactic center. I started with this black hole, Sagittarius A star, and let me uh, conclude with this black hole. Uh, last year, uh, Reinhard Genzel's group monitored a new source, an infrared source, close to Sagittarius A star. At first, they thought maybe it's another star that they haven't seen before. But then they realized that this source is extended. It's not point-like. And in fact, it has a tidal tail. And it turns out that this, this is a cloud of gas uh, plunging towards Sagittarius A star. And it will reach pericenter, the distance of closest approach, exactly a year from now. And so the interesting question is, what is it? What made this gas cloud and uh, why is it falling towards the black hole? And uh, we wrote, together with Ruth Moore Clay, we offered uh, an explanation. Uh, there is actually a young ring of stars uh, that were formed um, less than 10 million years ago around Sagittarius A star. We see massive stars uh, in a ring that has an inner uh, radius of around uh, 0.04 parsecs, uh, roughly 10 to the uh, 17 centimeters, and an outer radius which is roughly 10 times bigger. Uh, and this inner radius of the ring coincides with the distance of farthest approach of this cloud. So in fact, it could have been a star that was kicked from the ring of young stars. Um, and our model is that this was actually a, a low-mass star. That's what, why we can't see a star at the center of the cloud. It was a low-mass star that had a protoplanetary disk uh, that lost mass uh, in a wind 
and the wind coming off the protoplanetary disk uh, is being tidally disrupted. And so this star will come back to its current location in 140 years. That's the orbital time. And within a year, we should see it passing uh, at a distance of uh, uh, about uh, a few thousand, uh, 2,000 uh, Schwarzschild radii from Sagittarius A star. And it would be interesting to watch the fireworks if there are any when it does so. So watch out for this event uh, a year from now, next summer. Uh, there were some simulations assuming that this cloud is being pressure confined, which is not our model. Our model is that it's a wind coming off a protoplanetary disk. But if the cloud is pressure confined, it should be totally disrupted uh, as, uh, as it gets close to the black hole. And finally, since there are pro protoplanetary disks, one would expect that there could be planets as well uh, in the vicinity of the black hole. And in fact, if you have a binary system in which you have two stars and planets around them, you can get slingshot ejection of planets at speeds that exceed 1,000 kilometers per second. We know about uh, hypervelocity stars, but there could be also hypervelocity planets. And um, in fact, you can get a hypervelocity star that carries a planet around it. And one way to tell is by looking for transits. As you monitor a hypervelocity star in the hell of the Milky Way, if it has a planet around it, you might see a, a, the occultation of the star when the planet uh, moves around it and happens to be uh, in front of the star. Um, and uh, the probability for transit, since these planets have to be very close to the star, the probability for transits uh, should be quite high if a planet survived in a tight orbit around a hypervelocity star. And of course, that could be another way to verify that planets form in the galactic center. So that's an artist view of what <laughs> it should be, what the view should be like from a planet uh, as it comes away from the center of our galaxy and runs out of the galaxy. It should be a, an amazing journey for any civilization that might sit on such a planet to witness uh, going from the very center close to the black hole out to the outskirts of the Milky Way galaxy within a few billion years. So let me summarize. Uh, the first uh, topic that I focused on was uh, the possibility of directly imaging uh, the silhouettes of the black holes in the Milky Way galaxy and in M87. Uh, and the, we have the technology right now to construct uh, radio interferometers that will allow us to obtain such, these two images and learn both about the accretion flow near these black holes and about uh, possibly testing uh, general relativity. And uh, black hole binaries uh, have interesting um, effects that, that are being pers uh, pursued and uh, can allow us to learn uh, or test general relativity um, during galaxy mergers. Before they produce uh, uh, gravitational waves that we hope to detect, perhaps if uh, extended LISA will be uh, funded one day. Um, and also, as the two black holes, uh, as they come together at larger distances, uh, we can see evidence for uh, dual black hole systems. Once they merge, uh, there may be a recoil of the black hole that would lead to an offset quasar, a quasar that is offset from the center of the galaxy, both spatially and in velocity space. And of course, there should be a recoiled black hole Black holes as uh, relics of the formation history uh, of the Milky Way. In the hell of the Milky Way, there should be star clusters around recoiled black holes. And there could also be uh, enhanced uh, rates uh, for tidal disruption of stars due to recoils. Thank you very much. for a very comprehensive and clear uh, lecture. So uh, I guess there are some questions for the audience that we can take. Mario. Mario. What's the dynamics of a system with an embedded black hole at the center of one that is interfacing? Is it, is it uh, self-regulating or would that more the core collapse? 
This is a very interesting question. Um, we actually simulated that in a follow-up paper with Ryan O'Leary. Uh, we have two papers on this subject. So the naive estimate is that um, when a black hole gets a kick, instantaneous kick, because the gravitational waves uh, provide the kick on a very short time scale compared to all relevant time scales in this star cluster, uh, the, the black hole uh, is, you can go to the rest frame of the black hole and then the stellar system around it is moving in the opposite direction with the same velocity. Um, the stars that had orbital speed that exceed this kick velocity will remain bound because their energy will still be negative relative to the moving black hole. But those stars that had an orbital speed less than the recoil velocity will be left behind. So basic, naively speaking, one would uh, imagine the black hole carrying with it all the stars in the innermost region that had characteristic speeds larger than the recoil speed of the black hole. Now, one can do a numerical simulation of this, and of course, um, the amount of stars that are being carried with the black hole depends also on the orientation of the, velocity, the recoil velocity relative to the orbital velocities of the stars. But uh, roughly speaking, that's what happens, and then the system is not static after that because it relaxes to a new equilibrium. So in fact, the density profile evolves uh, given the fact that the system will not maintain a sharp boundary. Uh, so in fact, sc stars do scatter off each other. And we did a Fokker-Planck uh, simulation in which we included the scatterings of the stars. And you find that some, some stars are being scattered uh, so that they become unbound. And uh, in fact, there is a diffusion of stars outwards and the density profile is modified. And so, in fact, there, there is a characteristic uh, distribution of stars around the recoil black holes that we calculated. And that guided us in terms of selecting candidates within the Sloan uh, Digital Sky Survey uh, photometric data set. Um, but this is good, isn't it? Because if you remove the stars, you're making what is left behind more about, so they're more likely to be directed to the surface. That's right. That's right. Uh, and in fact, we can pretty much see all of these uh, systems all the way to the edge of the Milky Way halo because uh, they're sufficiently bright. The question is uh, how to find them, how to identify them. And the best way to do it is spectroscopically because the characteristic velocity dispersion of the stars will reflect the black hole mass. You would infer that there is a dark mass at the middle because the amount of mass associated with the stars is negligible. It's roughly a percent of the mass of the black hole. So this star cluster would not be able to bind itself unless there was the black hole at the center. And another way to say it is that it's very compact, a parsec, less than the size of a globular cluster, and a much higher velocity dispersion than a globular cluster. So if you have spectroscopic data, it should be straightforward to tell these objects relative to globular clusters or other, for example, the dwarf galaxies that are in the background. But right now, the data set that we had was only photometric. And of course, follow-up work needs to be done to find these systems. So that's a very interesting question. What will be uh, the future uh, of the um, activity of uh, black hole accretion as the Milky Way and Andromeda merge? Uh, the situation is similar to mergers that take place at earlier times, except for one important aspect. The gas in the Milky Way and in Andromeda was already mostly used up to make stars. So the collision here occurs relatively late. And the level of fueling of the black holes during the merger depends on how much cold gas is available. So um, we would expect, indeed, some accretion, but it would not be a powerful quasar that would result from the merger. So uh, the, 
the reason that uh, powerful quasars are produced is that uh, when you consider a, a disk, a disk uh, galaxy, the bulge is usually quite small. And, and, and the black hole mass correlates with the bulge luminosity or the bulge mass. Uh, so when a, an elliptical galaxy is made as a result of two, a, a merger of two disk galaxies, the bulge mass can go up by orders of magnitude. Even though the mass of the combined system only doubled, the bulge mass was initially very small, and now becomes the mass of the whole system. So it grows by orders of magnitude, and therefore the black hole mass can, in principle, grow by orders of magnitude. And that's how you get a quasar, a bright system that lights up at the center of an elliptical galaxy. In the case of the Milky Way merging with Andromeda, the merger is very late. There will not be much gas around, and therefore the black hole, the, the final black hole, will not be uh, perhaps as large as you would expect from the M sigma relation. Uh, but it's a very interesting uh, question. There is another question that we are now exploring. If you were to consider the local group of galaxies, there is Andromeda, there is the Milky Way, there, is, um, there are other satellites. And you can go back in time and ask when these satellites were passing by, if you were to play the movie backwards, there might have been a phase during which the central black holes were lit up, either in the Milky Way or in Andromeda. And this could have had interesting uh, influence on the evolution of those galaxies as well, as you go back in time. Any other question? Actually, I, I do have a short one. So you mentioned the fact that uh, to solve the problem of the early uh, evolution and, and growth of quasars, then one way to, to uh, achieve that would be just to have a short edit on time due to the fact that the, the flow is optically thick. Right. Now, what type of condition would you think are required in order for that, that thing to work properly? So we explored actually this uh, quantitatively in a paper with uh, Stuart Wyeth uh, last year. And um, what you need is uh, a lot of gas falling onto the black hole such that the column density of the gas makes the photon diffusion time longer than the free fall time. And we spe specify the conditions and uh, re uh, we demonstrated that when you go to high enough redshift, you get those conditions. Um, it's, uh, the situation is very similar to what happens when a star collapses, the core of a star collapses to make a black hole. You might ask, how can you make a black hole so quickly? Uh, because obviously the accretion rate of, of uh, gas is much larger than the Eddington limit would allow you. And the answer is that the core of the star does have, produce a lot of radiation as it collapses. But that radiation is unable to escape because the gas is so optically thick that it carries the radiation with it as it makes the stellar mass black hole at the center. And that's an extreme example where uh, the accretion rate is more than, uh, you know, more than 10 orders of magnitude larger than Eddington as you make the black hole. A milder version of that is necessary to make the early black hole. So, instead, so one way to do that, for example, is to make a supermassive star. Uh, if you make a supermassive star that eventually collapses to make a black hole, you automatically get this photon trapping. Uh, so, of course, if you um, somehow manage in, uh, to make in some, some galaxies uh, supermassive black holes, su supermassive seeds of black holes as a result of the existence of supermassive stars, that will give a jump start to the process that I described. So instead of starting with a 10 solar mass seed, now you can start with 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar mass seed. And when you ask how do you make this seed, the answer is just like you make it in the center of a normal star, uh, except that now the star is much more massive, and it traps the radiation as it collapses to the black hole. So, um, if there are no other questions, and before we thank Kavi, I'd like to remind you that tomorrow we will have the last lecture, the fourth lecture, and after that we will have also a small cocktail, so you're all invited to celebrate the end and say goodbye to Avi, who is leaving on Thursday. So it's last Today and tomorrow are the last days if you want to talk to him. I remind you that he's uh, sitting in Office 21 on the third floor here. So, let's thank Avi again for... Thank you.